Hello, welcome back to Tetrionics. In this discussion we'll be covering the quantum field geometrics that give rise to the interactive forces of electromagnetic and electrostatic fields in nature. We'll touch on how to model and describe the EM force vectors within these fields, the electric permittivity and magnetic permeability components of electromagnetic fields and how they relate to spatial impedance itself and then we'll look at the geometries of electrostatic and electromagnetic fields themselves how they're made up of quantized components and how they can lead in turn to parallel anti-parallel magnetic fields in nuclear studies and quantum scale magnetic moments for particles in motion Aside from Faraday, or Michael Faraday, and his work on magnetic lines of force, possibly the greatest unifier of electrical and magnetic studies, or fields, in the physics field, was James Clerk Maxwell. He mathematically brought together the work of Gauss, Faraday, and Ampere into a set of equations that describes the relationship of electric and magnetic fields as they propagate through space and how they relate to light itself and heat. His equations are a mathematical description of the geometry that's presented in tetrionics. You might say that his is the language, the descriptive words, whereas tetrionic geometry is the physical visual geometry, the grammar, that corrects and justifies, gives rise to the mathematics that we use. In other words, the geometry, the Planck geometry of tetrionics is inherent within nature. The mathematics that we use to describe it is just a human construct that emerges from these geometries. Up until now, we didn't know the geometry that the mathematics was describing. So it's led to a number of abstractions and incorrect um, ideas, hypotheses over time. Using equilateral geometries, tetrionics sets about rectifying these misconceptions in mathematics and showing in turn showing the geometric reality that underpins nature. One of the important things to come out of Maxwell's work was the fact that electromagnetic radiation propagates at a set velocity according to the impedance of the spatial region that it, it moves in. I'll touch more on that later, but it's just to say that the uh, inherent property of energy is its ability to do work or to move, exert a force over a distance. And if there's nothing to act on, energy itself will still will reach out, spread out over time to try and exert a force on something. So when we release energy at a point, it spreads out from that point until it interacts with a body of matter, more than likely, or other electromagnetic fields. In which case, the linear momentum, the square root linear momentum of these fields will interact to create forces and either move charges or bring, attract and repel charges. So what we'll do in this lecture is we'll show exactly what the first type of thing or the first field that Planck quanta zero point fields can make as they combine. They obviously combine either via their electric and or magnetic components. And in doing so, they create larger and larger fields of either positive or negative charged energies. This energy again has square root linear momentum. It can be measured in a uh, a light second spatial coordinate system C squared 
as a measure of inertial mass where the inductive masses equate to inertial mass and these positive and negative charge fields are simply the result of the asymmetric distribution of plus and minus Planck coins within those fields remembering that each equilateral scalar field has new squared Planck quanta within them and invariably they arrange in such a way that within any field there will always be an imbalance between the positive and the negative charges that make up that field resulting in the field itself either being a positive or negative electrostatic field if we were to or if we wanted to describe an electromagnetic field as opposed to electrostatic drawn here we would simply combine a positive and negative charge field back to back along the magnetic dipole to form a photon and that photon would have a neutral electric field because there's a positive and the negative and it would have a highlighted or strengthened magnetic dipole or magnetic moment where the norths would come together and the south would come together to form a magnetic moment or as it's I believe it's termed an Evans photomagneton for a photo for a photon but all the equations and all the formulations of Maxwell's equations simply relate back to these zero point fields how they combine to form photons of electromagnetic radiation and what we'll now discuss is the electric and magnetic properties of those fields within any zero point field or within zero point energy itself is an electromagnetic field the magnetic field as we as I've mentioned is a dipole field there are two distinct magnetic fields and a singular electric field there is always a dipole you do not find magnetic monopoles in nature because nature itself has to be made up of the energy of zero point fields and they in turn have magnetic dipole fields we've touched on before how the electric and magnetic field characteristics can be modeled as a short circuited inductive loop with a magnetic coil at the base leads running off to a battery and a current flowing through that inductive loop creating a north and south magnetic dipole reverse the current reverse the windings of the coil and you end up with a south north versus a north south and that's in principle all that's happening in a field of energy as the fields created energy Planck coins are released into that field or released into space and time into space I should say over time and the positive or negative sides of each quantum coin come together in such a way as to create larger scale equilateral fields these equilateral fields have an imbalance or an asymmetry of positive and negative charges plus and minus Planck coins that results in them having a net positive or negative charge they're built up of either positive or negatives they'll always have an imbalance until you bring two of these equilaterals together to form a photon or an electromagnetic field we'll touch on that shortly but in this case we've highlighted the magnetic dipoles within the field we'll touch on the electric shortly but the magnetic component is represented in omega fluxes as the two base mu um, noughts they can be north south in the case of a clockwise flux or south north in the case of an anti clockwise flux but that geometry that symmetry always remains no matter how you rotate it or flip it positive charges are always modeled with a uh, clockwise rotation 
negative charges have a anti-clockwise rotation to them. In reality, it is simply the arrangement of the magnetic dipoles within that scalar field that gives rise to this north-south or the perception of a north-south flux or north-south spin curl arising. You can see here the, the asymmetric distribution of these Planck quanta within the or the smaller equilateral coins within the scalar field gives rise to a distribution of magnetic dipoles where on the left hand side we have north poles presented outermost. On the right hand side we have south poles presented outermost for positive charge fields. For a negative charge field the opposites occur. The south is on the left hand side and the north is on the right. This is simply a feature of geometry, of energy itself. Electromagnetic energy f couples via the quantum coins to create these larger electrostatic fields. And in those fields electric or electromagnetic energy can be said to flux, spin or curl in either a clockwise or anti-clockwise direction. In reality there is no flux, spin or curl there is just the geometry. The vector rotations, the, the fluxes etc that have drawn in tetrionics in QM and that are described throughout modern physics literature do not exist. What does exist is the equilateral geometry of Planck coins themselves. The intrinsic magnetic dipoles exert a force at right angles to the force that the electric field creates, like an inverted T, upside down T. So the electric field creates a force that goes from top to bottom. The magnetic dipole creates a force that goes from the center of the field left and right in both directions outward. Again it's an inherent property of the field. That baseline is where the magnetic field is strongest. You can see it by the width of the triangles. That is the maximum amplitude of the magnetic field. That's where its force is strongest. You'll normally hear magnetic vectors or magnetic lines of force described as propagating from north to south, particularly in bar magnets. And while this is true, it's it's indicative of, of our macro scale prejudices. While it does external to the source propagate from north to south, and you can see that in the flux here, it's fluxing from within the the omega flux from this magnetic north pole through the electric and back out so it is indeed going from north to south when it comes to the internal mechanics of the magnetic dipole it goes from south to north so externally north to south internally south to north in all cases and that's mirrored in the omega fluxes as well. So we now have a an electromagnetic or an electroinductive means of describing electromagnetic fields of force and we have a geometric means of describing it and a mathematical. But the electrical and the mathematical are just reflections or descriptions of the inherent geometric properties or geometrics that are at work. This is the the real player of the game, the equilateral geometry. All the other mathematics, all the other electrical descriptions are attempts to model or describe what the simple triangles of Planck energy are doing. When we talk charged fields, electrostatic fields, most people have, the, or at least I do, have the assumption that the positive charge and the negative charge relates to the electric component. 
because that's where the vector force is applied. Uh, a positive charge pushes a negative, well, attracts a negative charge, whereas a negative electrostatic field will repel a, uh, a negative charge particle. That description comes from our observations. The reality underpinning it is quite different. We've already seen how we can model things with our mega fluxes, and we've seen how the magnetic dipole is at right angles to the electric field. But the electric field itself, positive or negative, is exactly the same energy. It's the opposite side of each quantum coin. And the, in, in reality, there is no difference between a positive electric field and a negative electric field in tetrionics. I've color coded them red for positive and black for negative to make it much easier down the track in following electrical conventions. But in reality, you'll occasionally see me color these red and black fields, or the electric fields, as a blue, to reflect the fact that a positive, the, the electric field of a positive charge and of a negative charge is exactly the same energy, has exactly the same, produces the exact same forces outward, in both cases, from the zero point singularity. You can see that the electric field is creating ha, contains the square root linear momentum. This is where the maximum electrical acceler acceleration occurs for a positive charge field, and it's identical to that of a negative charge field. What's the difference then between a positive charge field and a negative charge field at the quantum level? It's the arrangement of the magnetic dipoles. You can see for a positive charge field, its magnetic dipole is a north-south dipole, whereas the negative charge has a south-north dipole, and they're modeled with clockwise and anti-clockwise omega fluxes. It's the orientation of the magnetic dipole that determines whether a field is a positive charge field or a negative charge field. The electric permittivity in both cases is identical. There is no difference between the electric energies. They both operate in the same direction outward. Electrostatic fields are divergent. They radiate outwards from their sources, both electrically and magnetically, as per this illustration. What the omega fluxes do is they serve to give an electrical representation of the geometrics at work. So the, ge the equilateral geometries of scalar electric permittivity and magnetic permeability dipoles can be represented with these fluxes. And you'll see that most crucially as we talk about electrostatic and electromagnetic fields. But all these inertial, inductive inertial spin curl fluxes, all this talk about oscillators, etc., is fallacious. The reality underpinning all, this, all the electrostatic and electromagnetic fields is the addition of zero-point fields of either positive or negative charges together within squared equilateral fields, or 2 pi photons slash EM fields. It's the geometry that's setting the, the ground for the mathematics, not the other way around. Nature cares not one hoot about what mathematics or what language we use to describe the geometry that she uses in order to make the physics of our universe. So what do these electric permittivity fields and magnetic permeability fields give us? Well, in short, there's a relationship that Maxwell stumbled upon when he took the cross product of the electric permeability, the diamond here, with the magnetic permeability dipole, the north-south field. The cross product is simply the scalar field here in this case. Electric bimagnetic gives us the surface area 
of a Planck quantum coin. So why is it expressed as the inverse of c squared? The short answer to this is, as from our very first discussions, we know that c squared is a spatial coordinate system based on the speed of light propagating over a, a given amount of time. In this case, one second. In one second, if a photon of light was released in the center of this circle, or a point in space, it would radiate in two directions from that source, up and down, for example, which would give us a radius of a circle C with a diameter 2C and a surface area of pi C squared. So the region of space that a photon can map out in one second is C squared. That's our spatial coordinate. Within that field, we can place electromagnetic energy which has again the electric and the magnetic components so that anything trying to move or spread out through that space or that region will encounter electric and magnetic forces and what is the triangle or the scalar area of energy it turns out to be the inverse of one light second, one over c squared. So Maxwell's formulation of electric permeability by magnetic, so electric permittivity by magnetic permeability to give us the impedance of free space, one over c squared, is actually just a measure of the electric and magnetic fields present in that region of space, or the electromagnetic fields per light second. When we drop energy into that region of space and allow it to spread out, it will encounter the electric and the magnetic fields that already exist in, in space. And according to the density of the electric and magnetic fields that exist in that region of space, it will be able to move at a set velocity or a particular velocity. In this case, the velocity turns out to be the speed of light, as it's normally termed. People most familiar with physics will always hear a disclaimer when they say C is the speed of light. And the disclaimer is that it normally refers to the speed of light in a vacuum, where the value is given as 299,792,458 meters per second light still has the speed c in glass and in water but the value is less the velocity has changed because the impedance in glass and in water there are more electromagnetic fields making up the matter and the molecules of glass and water so therefore to propagate through it light has to move slower because it's encountering, encountering more electro, electric and magnetic fields in the material so its velocity slows down but it's still C. The units that Maxwell came up with and, and that were derived prior to him by Ampere and uh, Faraday are quite complex but they, they basically um, are derived by the current that flows in two parallel wires one amp of current flowing in two directions in two parallel wires will create a magnetic field and that magnetic field exerts a force and you can measure that force and then we can define the electric constant from one ampere and the magnetic constant from the force that one ampere creates to give us known values for electric and magnetic fields along with the SI units, the rather bewildering, confusing, incredibly mind-boggling SI units for magnetic constants and, and electric constants. Of course, if you cross-multiply those SI units for the electric and the magnetic, you end up with units of second squared per meter squared, which is the inverse velocity or inverse C squared. 
So you can see how the mathematics all interrelates back to the geometry. 1 over c squared, but you will never see or hear a, 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 a academic at present describing 1 over c squared as to do with, well, you'll hear him say it's, it's to do with the impedance of free space, but you will never hear them describe c squared as the region of free space and as the as energy as being the inverse of it again it comes out in the the geometry that you can now see before you we now see why electric fields propagate orthogonally to magnetic dipoles and we'll go on to explain why norths attract souths souths attract norths when in fact that's not precisely what's happening but suffice to say at this point we can now see that electromagnetic energy has force vectors within it within its scalar geometry which we can describe mathematically and in fact the basic mathematics gives rise to my unified field equation for mass energy where inertial mass is a measure of the number of charge quantum coins or total energy per light second m equals n pi e divided by c squared e equals m m equals e divided by c squared or e equals m c squared it can all be derived from there along with an explanation of what the electric permittivity and magnetic permeability of any region of space actually looks like based on its energy content which is what relativity calls stress energy tensors those tensors can be drawn quite simply here is a tensor or the geometrics of a tensor for an electromagnetic radiation we can see it as two bosons combined to give us a frequency of light that it's related to Planck's constant through the geometry and that it because of the electric permittivity and magnetic permeability of any region of space that photon of energy will move out in two directions at once because again as we touched on previously uh, if I can find the right one the electric the north sorry the positive and negative linear momentum are identical back to back the radiation spreads out along the electric and the magnetic at the same time but the electric field which is how we measure photons propagates along the electric field permittivity two directions at once so we can also rearrange that formulation of 1 over c squared equal to the cross product of the electric permittivity by the magnetic permeability to just allow us to derive values for the electric permittivity or the magnetic either one can be derived we'll do the other one shortly but you'll see it's just a algebraic rearrangement of that formulation and all we're doing by mathematically rearranging it is highlighting what we're talking about in this case it's the electric field permittivity the the how easily energy will spread through a region of space again c squared is the region of space per light second we've released the energy and it will propagate in this direction that's the electric field of force the the distance of the plank length of work if you like again there's the units force per meter and it relates to that the strength of that force relates to how many Planck quanta are present in that field n h nu in the scalar field h nu squared we can determine the make the strength of the electric permittivity constant by the means I just discussed before but the charge is always determined by the distribution of positive and negative Planck coins within that scalar field so the net Q charge 
of a positive um, electrostatic field where the field itself diverges from its point source is dependent on the number of Planck quanta in that field the amount of energy released and the arrangement of positive and negative charges in the case of a positive charge electrostatic field there will be more positive charges than negative charges but there will always be negative charges as well and likewise with a negative charge field there is simply more negatives in that field than there are positives but the positives are there all the same this is important this is very important because up until now in most texts in fact I dare say in all texts electrical or physical you will find that a positive electrostatic field is described as positive charges spreading out from a point source and negative charge electrostatic field is being negative charges spreading out from a point source we've now just shown that this is not the case positive electrostatic electrostatic fields have negative components negative electrostatic fields have positive components and the difference is in the positive field the positives radiate along this linear, square root linear momentum outwards so the positives that you see the red ones are pointing outwards while the negatives forming part of the triangle if you look closely that attaches to the positive points in the opposite direction remember what we said about the photon being a positive one direction negative the other as these fields come together with positive and negatives photons or two new bosons one points outwards one inwards that is to say in a positive charge field the positive Planck quanta diverge point outward and there's more of them so because there is more of them and more are pointing outwards the field will always radiate outwards there's more energy pushing outwards than there is pointing inwards but there still is a component of charges pointing inwards and likewise with a negative field there are more negatives pointing outwards diverging but there still remains some convergent inward pointing positive charges they're the mirror symmetry of each other positive and negatives this mirror symmetry occurs everywhere in nature but the asymmetry of the distribution of positive and negative quantum coins leads to the probabilities of quantum mechanics leads to the rise of charged fields and charged particles it's a key part remember now we're still only talking mass energy and because modern physics relates the 4 pi of Gauss's formulation to spheres point particles rather than tetrahedra with equilateral asymmetric distributions of mass energy it has no inkling and no idea that divergent electrostatic fields can contain a convergent component this is crucial as we come we'll come to touch on regarding um, Coulomb's charge interactions and even further down when we start to look at the mechanics of quantum gravitation and gravitation in general as it applies universally so these arrangements of positive and negative charge electric fields the permittivity component of electromagnetic fields can be coupled they couple when the north-south magnetic dipoles of the Planck coins join together opposites attract north and south come together when they do they bring two opposite charge zero point fields or two opposite charge electrostatic fields together we've still got their omega fluxes indicated there we'll touch on that shortly but in doing so what we've created here is a photon two bosons two charge bosons 
but we don't have a neutral photon in either case what we have is a charged photon and that's what makes up electrostatic fields that's a point particle whether it's a, a particle itself or just a source of energy radiating energy out in both directions is negative in all directions radiating out from it remembering again as we just touched on even though this is a negative field some of the components of it are positive and likewise even though these are positive electrostatic fields some of the components are negative and pointing inwards rather than outwards so normally you would see a negative electrostatic field drawn like this but without those little pink or red arrows pointing inwards it would just be a negative charge with lines of force spreading out from it this is the polar view the top down view of this field here those arrows pointing outwards are the linear momentum pointing in either direction so the negative overall a negative field extends out from a negative particle but we now know that within that negative charge field there is some positive Planck quanta pointing inwards and likewise with a positive field predominantly positive pointing outwards always no, all positive pointing outwards and a smaller number of negative pointing inwards we can draw that in full detail as I've done here it's a bit hard to see probably in the things but the files the illustrations are available online so you can go and, and blow them up look closely at them and you'll see in this negative charge field the magnetic dipole is more or less cancelled so you don't tend to detect the magnetic properties because they balance out but what you do detect is this overabundance or surplus of negative charges you don't notice the positives so much but you do detect the negatives and if a negative charge comes near it what's going to happen well as the negative comes in it's going to encounter encounter an outward pointing negative force which will force the negative away I'll do it on this side seeing the point is in red as the the positive comes into the positive it encounters a positive force and is deflected away so similars or same charges repel but what happens when the positive charge comes over to the negative it's not affected by the the negative charge pointing outwards it follows the line of the positive charges which points inwards and is drawn into the negative so the idea that there's a uh, that opposites attract and similars repel generally is fine but it doesn't give the full picture it's not a unidirectional negative force pointing outwards it's a bidirectional force made up of positive and negative charges or arranged in such a way that objects of different charge will react differently as they approach those fields because bear in mind out here a positive charge coming in and getting close to this negative charge will just a feel just feel just a little bit of electric field force I'll do it down here just a little bit of electric field force not much but then it encounters a little bit of red pulling it this way or directing it this way then a bit more and then there's more red vectors pulling it in and more and more and more all the way through so it's accelerated towards the center of the charge and this happens from either side on this side exactly the same thing the negatives are pointing outwards the positives are pointing inwards and it pulls it into the center of the object the magnetic fields guide it they just bump it along and, and tell it how to get and reach the center focus of those fields the zero point singularity of the electrostatic fields surrounding these particles so whereas you've seen well we'll see in many texts a positive charge with positive lines radiating out and it will be called a source you will often see the negative charge with negative lines pointing in 
and it will be termed a sink. That is now incorrect. Even on electrical theory, it is now incorrect. It's been hinted at for a long time, with conventional versus electron charge, etc. But now we can see the mechanics for it. Electrostatic fields always have divergent fields of one charge or the other. But they also have a convergent component, which is weaker than the divergent. But it's that convergent divergent component of positive and negative charges that dictates how a, a particle will react as it approaches or interacts in that field. One simple positive charge here will be attracted to that negative. The same positive charge here will be repelled from that positive charge. That's the mechanics via the field geometry that's really going on. This is the mechanics that Coulomb attempted to describe in his formulation for charge uh, attractions. This is what tetrionics now corrects. As I said, the magnetic fields only steer electrical, electrically accelerated particles. The electrically accelerated particle will come down, it might be coming at a tangent here and heading this way. Even though it is a proton or a positron, it is still just like the fields made up of plus and minus Planck coins. And those Planck coins have not only electric positive and negative charges, but as I've said, magnetic dipoles. Those magnetic dipoles will interact just like the electric does to steer it. So it might come in at an angle like this and be bent to the center of the field. That bending is called Lorentz. Um, not transformer, but transform on the brain. <laughs> Lorentz forces. And it's what's used in linear accelerators, etc. And in uh, collider experiments to both steer particles using strong magnetic fields and accelerate them using the electric component and it's also used to determine what type of particle it is that's created in the experiment when they crash together because a particle of a certain amount of mass which is just a certain number of triangles with a certain charge will bend in one direction whereas the negative antiparticle will bend in the other direction and the more mass it has the longer it will travel in a straight line before it starts to bend so the electric and again that bending and how far it travels is determined by what? by what the spatial impedance of the region that it's moving in so when you build a collider you then have to factor in the the spatial impedance of the area of the detectors so that you can start to begin to predict what particles curve what way as you're doing your discoveries and that very principle is how mass spectrometers work. How we identify various elements and particles from others. V various chemical compounds based on the direction that they turn, how far they travel and their chemical makeups. So again we have a positive electrostatic field here and it has a distinct north-south magnetic moment. So a positive electrostatic field with a north-south magnetic moment resulting from the number of Planck coins within that scalar field. On this side we have the mirror image negative magnet electrostatic field. And you can see that again in this case it has a south-north versus the north-south magnetic moment orientation and its omega fluxes are the mirror image of the positive. What creates the mirror image? You could draw a fictitious line down the middle and it would be the asymmetry of the equilateral coins within the equilateral scalar fields that creates that asymmetry. And bearing in mind everywhere you see that these photons of magnetic dipoles you have an electric component that's neutralized because in that case the electric charges have come together the north and the positive and the negative to create 
a strong magnetic dipole. We'll touch on this later. But there again, whereas before we talked about the electric permittivity, now we're talking about the magnetic permeability. And we've just rearranged the algebra, the formulation, to give us the, the value that we're looking for. And it's just showing us that there's... Well, in fact, the equation doesn't show us that there are, in fact, two dipoles. It's just a given from the fact that we always measure a north and a south with a current moving through a wire. But magnetic permeability does not by itself, as a formula, dictate that that should appear as two magnetic regions. But we now know that it does because this is what we've built tetrionics on and so far we've explained everything. And we'll go on to explain everything else using this simple geometry. As I said, Ampere's law, or the flow of current through a wire, is how we measure the magnetic force and determine the magnetic constant. Simply put, what we do is we, we place two wires parallel to each other, about a metre in length, and we run a current in one direction and a current in the other through the wires, which moves charged particles, electrons, in either direction. When the particle moves, that charged particle will have a chem field with a north-south, south-north magnetic moment because it's a negative. I'll highlight the point here. If it was a negative and moving in this direction, that would be its chem field. It'd be a south-north dipole moving along the wire. And that's what you can see represented by these zero-point models here. You can see I put a circle just re representing a spherical point particle. I say its net charge is minus one elementary, so it's an electron. So we have an electron moving from where I've highlighted, from left to right through the wire. In doing so, it has a south-north magnetic moment. We don't need to use the right-hand rule or any other hand rule to determine that. We simply know the field geometry now. It becomes child's play. Forget your hand rules. No need for them. We now know the geometry of the energy of the field. We know that as that field moves, the faster it moves, the more coins it has in it. The more coins it has in it, the more little triangles and, and the more energy is in that field, which we can measure as a form of mass, inertial mass. Uh, that comes up in relativity. So this part, this electron moving this way, will have a north-south arrangement. The same electron in the other wire, going in the opposite direction, will still have a north-south arrangement in, with respect to its direction of travel, but we now see that those two currents moving in opposite directions will repel. Similar charges moving in opposite directions repel each other because you've got two south poles. So what happens if we reverse the current in one of the wires? so that the current flows in the same direction through both wires. That's what happens over this side, on the right-hand side. In this case, we have the same two electrons, or two similar identical electrons, both moving in the same direction through the two wires, parallel to each other. But instead of a repulsive force, we now have an attractive force. So in Ampere's law, something peculiar happens. We no longer have opposites attract and similars repel or sames repel we now have a situation where same particles moving in opposite directions attract but same particles moving in the same direction sorry I think I mucked that up same particles moving in the opposite direction repel same particles moving in the same direction attract if you go to look up the reason for this similars attracting in Ampere's law, you will find pages and pages and books and books trying to explain it. None of them give you an explanation as simple as this. This is the field geometry that nature uses. Nothing complex. Nature doesn't care about the math, doesn't care about relativity, Einstein, myself... 
pointing nobody nature just simply says i've made a field of uh, made a field using plank coins they have a geometry the geometry will interact according to its forces we can now draw those fields when it will mirror the forces that are implied and away you go you can of course include the inductive omega loops loops fluxes that i've spoken about and drawn and will continue to do so for a while and you can see in the case of a neutral or neutralized electromagnetic field which this is the magnetic dipole is strengthened but the positive and negative charges cancel out we can still model this and we can see why it's reinforcing because if you follow the fluxes it goes from the electric positive electric into the magnetic from the south to the north back out to the negative electric into the south through to the neg to the through the north back into the positive and it follows this lemonscape loop it's a, a transformer it transforms positive electrical magnetic energies into negatives the flux of energy continues forever until the photon is destroyed or absorbed on and on it goes forever and it doesn't matter if you use an anti-photon which is the mirror image of a photon same thing applies from the positive into the magnetics from the magnetics into the electrics negative electrics back into the magnetics back into the positive the energy circulates in reality it's not circulating we have static equilateral geometries combining but we can now model and explain Ampere's laws and Lorentz's force laws which are force the the laws due to the magnetic fields as well as Ampere's laws which is the electric force laws all in one diagram and explain why in the case of Ampere's opposites moving in opposite directions repel but opposites moving in the same direction attract sorry mucked it up again similars well, the same particles moving in opposite directions repel same particles moving in same direction attract you have to follow the geometry and concentrate on what you're saying and talking about but again it all comes back down to these photons in this case or electromagnetic and electrostatic fields made up of photons 2 pi charge geometries we have an, a mag, an electric permittivity acceleration component and a magnetic permeability perturbation component ampere forces Lorentz forces they're all involved but we can now explain why ampere's force laws have a different outcome to coulomb's force laws which is key when you're trying to explain everything using one simple geometry. So what is the, the very heart of the difference between electrostatic and electromagnetic fields? We know they have exactly the same geometries as shown in the center. They have a zero point singularity sort of at the base, it's at the base of both positive and negative charge fields irrespective of which way they're pointing right at the very center of the electric and the magnetic where both the electric and the magnetic reach zero we have a zero point singularity for a photon it's where the electric fields and magnetic fields have no effect in a bar magnet you would call that the block wall in a open brackets black hole close brackets you'd call that the event horizon the point singularity but in both cases the electrostatic fields made up of Planck quantum coins diverge outwards and we know that as we add more and more energy if this was just a photon there'd be one pointing outwards in one direction positive in one direction negative in the other in the case of an EM field as more energy was added we would have 
a predominance of positive pointing out in one direction, negative in the other. But there'd also be a convergent component that accelerates things to the center. Sinks and sources are inaccurate descriptions of what's going on. So we now know that there's no magnetic monopoles because we have dipoles in zero point fields as well as photons. So in bosons and in photons, there's always a dipole so far as magnetism is concerned. The difference between the electrostatic field and the electromagnetic is how the Planck coins come together. If two charged fields come together via their magnetic attraction, so north and south magnetic poles attract, they do so, when they do so, they will always form a neutralized magnetic component and a strong electric component. So what we will measure is not the magnetic, but the electric accelerations that these fields produces. Hence the term electrostatic fields, because they sit, they, they originate from a point. The, cent the zero point here would be a particle of matter or an inductor of some form, be it quantum or otherwise would be radiating this field so it would have a zero point singularity a, a, a point where the electric and magnetic fields meet but because the magnetic fields um, the north and south components equal each other exactly we don't we can't measure the north and south because if you bring in a north pole to measure this field it will be attracted to the south but also repelled by the north so it would behave as though it's not there it's equally pulled and pushed likewise from either side but if you put a charged particle in here it will be accelerated one direction or the other depending on the charge a negative charge coming into here will be attracted to the center because of the convergent component zero, uh, quantum coins in that field a negative particle placed near this field will be repelled because of the excess number of divergent negatives. As you you get familiar with it, you'll understand this a lot clearer, and you'll I hope you've I've made it as clear as I can. But it's just the number of quanta within those fields pointing inwards or outs that creates this attraction or repulsion. There's nothing relativistic going on, there's nothing magical, there's no entanglement, there's no virtual particles. It's simply a field of whatever size, depending on how long your time measurement is, expanding out through space or stretching out through space and the energy momenta of those fields pushing or pulling on a charged particle. So the electrostatic fields affect charged particles predominantly. Magnetic fields, on the other hand, exactly the same field geometry, but what's happened is a positive and a negative field have come together. These are two similar fields, positive, positive, negative, negative. But in the case of magnetostatics, as they should be termed, we have a positive negative coming together, forming a neutralized electric field. So electrical particles don't really get affected because they're pushed and pulled just like the magnetics were here. But in this case, the magnetic particle will be confronted with two souths, so a north pole coming in will be attracted. The repulsion would only occur on the opposite side, which is exactly what we experience in bar magnets. One end or the other. It's a reinforced magnetic moment. This is how nature makes bar magnets at the quantum scale, magnetic moments. It uses magnetostatic fields positive and negative charge quanta coming together but they have exactly the uh, magnetic moment photon has exactly the same geometry as an electrostatic photon the only difference between the two is the arrangement of charges within those fields and a magnetostatic photon is more commonly known by the name electromagnetic photon because we do now recognize that there is an electric component 
to the magnetic component. The magnetic is called the Evans photomagneton. The electric component combined with the electric forms the photon of electromagnetic radiation that Maxwell described in his equations. So now that we have an understanding of the geometry and the dynamics of electrostatic and electromagnetic EM fields, let's have a closer look at exactly how they work. In the case of charge we have again three different types in essence. We have a positive charge electrostatic field, a negative charge electrostatic field, and we have two forms of electromagnetic field which are virtually identical. You can flip it over if you if you view this from the other side you'll see the same thing. That's why a photon is called an antiphoton. The field geometries are such that, and the surality of, of zero point fields, quantum coins, means that these two field, two um, neutral charge ones can be represented in the same drawing. So let's just look at the, the Planck quanta that make them up. In the case of a neutral one, if you count all the positive coins in the positive electrostatic component and all the well, sorry let's change that count all the divergent positives in the positive electrostatic field and the convergent positives in the negative electrostatic field you come up with a number you do the same thing for the negatives count the neg number of divergent negatives in the negative electrostatic field and the number of convergent negatives in the positive electrostatic field because these fields balance out to create the magnetic dipole you'll find that they cancel out there is exactly in the um, positive charge field there is a an imbalance of 8 there's 36 positives here sticking outwards 28 negatives pointing inwards in the negative field there is 28 positives pointing inwards 36 negatives pointing outwards which gives us in total 64 positive charges pointing in one or the other direction and 64 negative charges or quantum coins pointing in one or the other direction giving us a net charge of zero so it's neutral that's the basis of, an of a, a photon or electromagnetic field it's a neutral field but a strong magnetic dipole still has an electric component but the magnetic is what's doing is the predominant feature same field geometry same number of quanta but this time we have two positive electrostatic fields coming together two bosons to make an electrostatic EM field you can see that it's definitely positive because in this case when we add up all when we count all the positives we have 72 positive charges and only 56 negative charges in that field giving us a plus 8 charge field in either direction all the positives are pointing outwards and all the negatives are pointing inwards as illustrated here the majority the bigger force is the divergent positive against the convergent smaller negative but it still exists and the mirror image of that exactly the same but reversed is seen here on the other side where we have only 56 positives versus 72 negatives the exact opposite of this side resulting in the opposite charge field we draw it exactly the same way a predominantly negative charge diverging from a negative charge point but with a convergent positive component what's the effect well the effect is if a proton was or a positron was in the center here it will be repelled from the left hand side field because the positive charges are pointing away it accelerates it in the direction of those arrows 
toward the negative charge. The negatives aren't affecting it, but those remaining positives pointing inwards will continue to attract it until it meets the negative charge. If it was the other way around, I'll use blue because I don't have black. Oops. Um, maybe I won't. <laughs> um, if this red dot was a negative, it would accelerate from the neg away from the negative point source of the field towards the positive, giving the impression that it was being attracted, which wouldn't be the case until it got close. It's just not impeded by the divergent positive charges. They do not impede it in any way. But the remaining smaller convergent negative charges continue to accelerate it until it meets the positive charge. This is the basis of Coulomb's law. This is the mechanics of how opposite charges attract and similar charges or same charges repel. You can see it here. Positive field. Much more clearly you can see that all the positives will be accelerated away from the source of that field. But on the other hand, in the case of a negative field, a positive charge is accelerated towards the centre of the field. And again, it's accelerated by the electric field, which extends it out further, and the magnetic field just steers it to the centre to make sure it gets to where it has to go. Again, we can model this either positive, a negative charge particles or positive charge particles using zero point field geometries for their kinetic chem fields and we can model the direction of their travel and give us the familiar opposites attract similars repel for either positive or negative electrostatic fields or even their behavior in electromagnetic fields where the magnetic field is steering and the electric field is accelerating particles and you can see the pos a positive charge particle will be drawn in to this field accelerated steered to the center and accelerated out of it in this direction along the page now we can see the field geometries and we can understand how it all comes about no need for the math no need for the complexities but we can look at all the arrangements of electrostatics and electromagnetic fields for the four types two of which are identical to each other for all intents and purposes and we can see how the the Coulomb's law of interaction opposites attract similars repel can now be modified to a tetrionic law of interaction and you'll see that crop up quite a lot it's interaction because it's not simply an attraction of opposite charges to each other but there's there's a interaction between the positive or between the attracted charge and the divergent field itself between the the uh, linear force electric vectors that make up that divergent field and the charge of the particle itself. They all interplay with each other to determine the amount of acceleration, in which direction, and, and how the particle, the charged particle is steered within the electromagnetic or electrostatic fields. It's simply an arrangement of plus and minus coins, nothing more. You could cut out millions of plus and minus quantum coins, print it on both sides, throw them on the floor, and a child could stick them together in a larger equilateral field or a larger diamond shaped field and end up with all these force laws. They all come out of an arrangement of plus and minus Planck quanta. Color code them and then you can see as we see here the effects of positive and negative um, electrostatic fields and you could also highlight the magnetic dipoles of each field arrangement. Something that you'll also notice is that if we use the modeling of the omega fluxes again, the omega loops, 
they show us the direction of flux for the external and internal magnetic dipoles with, that these fields create. And that's how we typically measure them via the magnetic fields or the acceleration of, of charges within these fields. The omega fluxes give us those answers. So, so far as the forces of interaction, formerly known as Coulomb's force law, we can now place a number of particles, two or more bodies, down and model their interaction or the, the motion of particles within those fields. You can see that in the case of positive charges and negative charge point sources, whatever's creating the field, a positive charge has an excess of positive Planck quanta, but still has some negative, whereas the negative has excess of negative Planck quanta, some positive. And that determines how these fields interact. A positive charge with a similar field coming towards it creates a field of tension of positive force vectors headbutting each other. They're both trying to push away from each other and in an ideal world if they're exactly the same forces the forces will be equal but in most cases there's a difference between the particles and one will accelerate the other more depending on its charge mass ratio. But that all the same we can still now see that whether they're two positives or two negatives there exists a field of tension, stress energy, linear momentum acting between the particles that's proportional to the strength of the charge and the distance between them and that's Coulomb's law Q1, Q2 by a force constant divided by the distance squared because they're inverse squared fields remember squared fields are equilaterals you've got two of them the further apart they are the less energy they have the more energy they have the more strength they have between them we measure that strength because in the region that overlaps because it's the these Planck quanta are not interacting with each other only the ones within that hexagon are physically butting up against each other so we have k q1 q2 over distance squared for either positive or negative charges or and that creates a repulsion remember because these charges are trying to push the opposite the same charge away from each other but what happens where we have a positive and a negative charge coming together where their fields overlap well we still have k q1 q2 over r squared or d squared either way but in this case the positive charge is still being accelerated towards the negative and the negative is still being accelerated towards the positive because of the convergent momenta of those fields so instead of a repulsion between the two same charges we have an attraction between the two particles that will bring them ever closer together until they meet and the force is no longer um, drawing them together they'll physically hit each other and stop at that point but the forces will still remain hence why it is difficult to pull them apart again but that K is just another way of describing the square of the energy the electric permittivity that exists between those two particles and the the strength of that permittivity depends on the charge of the field how many Planck quanta exist in either the positive or the negative field and what uh, arrangement of plus and minus charges exists determines whether they attract or repel each other that's Coulomb's law drawn in one illustration and explained if you only have one, which is what the equation here is describing, the force from a particular charge, you have the charge, you have the energy of the field, the electric permittivity of the field, the diamond shaped, with its collinear linear momentum, and the force is the um, number of, of divergent um, Planck quanta pointing outwards that you have in that field to exert a force at the tip of that triangle or anywhere in that field obviously you get down here you've got more acting on you 
till you get to the point here. But as you're going in also, the electric field is, is becoming less and less and the magnetic is becoming stronger, steering you to that center point. But that's Coulomb's force law in a nutshell. The electromagnetic field lines for those same fields are the same thing. They're just a positive and a, sorry, a positive and a negative charge coming together. Positive and a negative boson form a photon. Positive and negative electrostatic fields form electromagnetic fields. We can model those fields using omega fluxes if we want, or we can model them using north to south magnetic flux fields of force lines but the magnetic force lines do not give us any indication as to the neutral electric field that exists and that's important because the existence of that field explains the moving conductor problem and completely ends up completely undermining some of the basic tenets of special relativity in respect to where the magnetic moment comes from but we'll touch on that next lecture but we can see that a magnetic field where we have a strong south or an enforced reinforced south north pole and a neutralized plus and minus e field is still an electromagnetic field and while i may have drawn it in two dimensions here as a slice the right hand side gives a, a clue as to what it's really like around a bar magnet. There are many of those fields pointing outwards in all three directions around the magnetic, around the, the iron core. The iron core simply serves to enhance the flux of energies in through the south, out through the north, back into the south it enhances that omega flux on either the positive or negative. You see that they all come into the south and exit through the north. They follow the magnetic lines of force. And in fact, they form a lemonscape. So the energy that's, that's put into a bar magnet remains in a bar magnet until you find some way to use it up or extract it. It's a permanent bar magnet. Again, this, this illustration just touches on the Ampere's force and, and Henry's work on, Joseph Henry's work on magnetic fields of force. He had, there are many formulations for calculating, as you can see here, magnetic fields of force between two wires with current in them. But this is amp, just a, a re-derivation of Ampere's law again. You have two wires where the eyes are with a current, for I for current, flowing in either one. It can be in the same direction or opposite directions. In this case, we can see that the magnetic fields tell us that there's a force of repulsion between the particles that are in motion in those wires. Now, they can be one of two examples as we touched on earlier before, and I'll just go back to it. If we have a repulsion between those wires, once I find it, there we go. That repulsion could be caused by two similar particles, or two identical particles moving in opposite directions, or the repulsion could be caused by two opposite charged particles moving in the same direction. So if this was a positive, it would be a north south dipole and you would have a north north repulsion so again tetrionics gives us the answer that you would normally use your right hand rule for to determine but it all comes back out of the simple geometry that's at work we now know that any current flowing will create an electromagnetic field or as you'll discover a chem field for the particle in motion and the dipoles of those chem fields, magnetic dipoles, will exert a force of either attraction or repulsion between the particles. Hence why I term it a, um, a interactive force rather than an attractive force or force of a law of attraction. It's a force of interaction. 
a magnetic dipole has the magnetic electromagnetic field sorry has a magnetic dipole from it from its point source likewise a chem field of a particle a charged particle in motion as we model here below it will move in either the particle will move in one direction or the other but it still has a magnetic moment so both an electromagnetic field a photon radiating outwards or a field radiating outwards and a particle in motion produces a magnetic dipole no magnetic moments uh, are present we measure that well we draw these as shown here with a south north and fields of force between them and we say that the fields of force between similars between opposites combine as you can see here and between the same fields they repel they exclude each other not quite what's going on but for all intents and purposes um, the drawings still remain fairly accurate they're just missing a lot of the detail in tetrionics we would actually have a number of lines radiating out from each of those point sources or the wires and that would show us what these magnetic dipole arrangements are on those wires so we we've now used tetrionics to explain fields of force magnetic fields of force to explain Maxwell's laws how he unified Gauss's work with Faraday's and Ampere's and, and we'll go much deeper into all of this in the QED lectures but suffice to say that tetrionics with its equilateral triangle can and does not only explain but reinforce the unification that Maxwell did just in a geometric sense instead of a mathematical but the the advantage of the geometric sense is I can't just abstract that will I have to follow what the geometry will tell us and the geometry sets the ground rules you can't just say um, zero points of the fields are where physics fail and we go into another dimension it does not happen it's simply a crossing point it's where the electric and magnetic fields reduce to zero before they invert or in some cases as in this case come back out in the same orientation but with a different electric field charge so there's an electric acceleration there so um, we can see that the omega fluxes that I use to model things mirror Maxwell's oh, sorry Faraday's lines of force so you could superimpose omega fluxes over any scalar field and it will give you the electromagnetic fields of force or flux spin curl rotation etc we can see that in this case we have parallel magnetic dipoles and the field arrangement of the triangles matches the field arrangement that we measure using compasses and and Faraday's work so there's no disagreement at all between them in fact we can even reverse them so we have anti-parallel magnetic dipoles and again if you look at the omega fluxes they match the omega fluxes the um, the, the exclusion of, of similar magnetic fields and the attraction of opposite magnetic fields it's all mirrored using the inductive fluxes of inductive mass energies or inertial mass energies particularly in the equilateral geometries things that we've drawn freehand or, or used as a an idea we can now use the tetrionic geometry to model and to extend that modeling into many other realms of, of physics Ampere's law for example relativity conduct moving conductor magnet problems etc so as to magnetic moments themselves the magnetic moment term normally comes up when an electrostatic particle with no magnetic dipole because they're cancelled out remember seems to have a magnetic moment or a magnetic dipole when it's accelerated a classic example would be an electron which when um, sitting still at rest is seen as a negative point source the electrostatic field is negative we know now it's predominantly negative it's not all negative there are some convergent positive components but the divergent negative field spreads it which is this one here over on the right hand side 
if there was an electron sitting in free space there would it would be seen to us that there is no magnetic dipole associated with that particle because the magnetic poles have all cancelled out and I'll show you in a lecture on leptons where we build a physical model of the lepton and you'll see that that is indeed what happens the magnetic fields cancel out leaving only 12 electrostatic fields radiating out from a point so if you follow the fields of force backwards to where those fields seem to be originating from you come to a zero point a point singularity or a point particle in terms of an electron at the center and you can't discriminate anything else from it it just looks like it's coming from that point in space because you don't understand the geometry now we do understand the geometry we know that the electron is sitting there with its unique shape radiating out these fields of n predominantly negative or sorry radiating out, radiating out net negative electrostatic fields there's still some positive component which is why the negative electron attracts positive charge particles or vice versa but that magnetic moment cannot be detected or measured so we say it's an electrostatic particle we know that all the Planck coins have magnetic mo dipoles there are no monopoles so therefore it's only the equal number of magnetic fields magnetic poles that makes this an electrostatic particle but when you move that particle it changes it stops being a purely electric electrostatic particle it suddenly has a magnetic moment that is to say it, it appears as though there's a north and south magnetic dipole associated with that particle only for as long as it's moving when you stop it moving it resume goes back to being a particle with no magnetic moment being purely electrostatic we can now see that in tetrionics if we push a particle for example if there was a particle located here on the bottom right bottom left that was a actually we'll do it bottom left that was a positive charge say a positron was here and we applied a force to it from the bottom of the page upwards the force would give that particle energy of motion the energy of motion would be stored in a chem field a kinetic em field it has an electric and a magnetic component magnetic dipole component it would move in the direction of the linear momentum which is the electric component the acceleration com uh, area of the scalar so it moves in that direction but when it wasn't moving it had no chem field no force applied it would appear as a purely positive electrostatic field just like this it looks like this it behaves like this there is no magnetic moment but the moment it's pushed a magnetic dipole appears either side of it out from the sides orthogonal or transverse to the direction of motion so the direction of motion is this way but the magnetic dipole north south is at right angles to it it always appears that way it doesn't appear collinear or anything else like that it always appears in that orientation why because of the geometry the force applies energy to the particle to make it move in a direction the chem field will always point in the direction of motion depending on what how which angle that force was applied in but the chem field will always point in that direction of motion and it will always have a neutral kinetic energy component because remember again positive and negative either side of this field made up of photons so it's neutral but in this case it has a because of its equilateral field it has a north-south dipole so you have a neutral energy neutral charge energy component creating an acceleration in one direction and that acceleration that motion creates a magnetic dipole at the quantum level remove that energy so there's no linear momentum no energy to no 
um, scalar energy to create the square root linear momentum and the particle stops with no energy in that field there is no field so the magnetic moment also disappears and we go back to being just a particle sitting there this undermines relativity relativity would say that the particle creates its magnetic moment because when you apply a force Instead of being a spherical object, it gets squashed into an oblong shape in its direction, transverse to its direction of motion. And that squashing in shape from spherical to oblong creates a magnetic moment. That's not the case at all. So in this one picture, introducing, explaining electrostatic fields, which is the basis of electrostatic particles, and explaining chem fields or electrostatic fields in motion for particles in motion we've now undermined the foundational tenet of special relativity but don't worry we'll undermine a few more to go yet so we now know that the chem field the kinetic energy magnetic moment of a particle of an electrostatic particle that has no magnetic moment when it's standing still is the result of its energies of motion. Those mass energies are stored in the chem field. The particle itself does not increase in mass. The particle itself, the, the positron in this case, does not it change its size, its shape or its weight or its charge. Nothing changes in the particle. What changes is the addition of this sec or the creation of this secondary chem field in the direction of in the co-direction of the applied force so the force pushes on it from the bottom of the page to the top there's a linear momentum and a chem field well a chem field with linear momentum applied to the uh, created that points to the top of the page and that creates or causes the particle to move towards the top of the page as it encounters resistance or the energy peters out for whatever reason the energy dissipates the magnetic moment gets weaker because there's less quanta in the field and then the field itself has no energy therefore there is no magnetic moment no forward motion and the particle returns to being an electrostatic particle at rest again I can't stress how much that undermines general a special relativity but we'll touch QED touches on it in much more detail. Suffice to say that we now have the mechanics of motion, of the mechanics of attraction and repulsion, and the creation of electrostatic and electromagnetic energy fields. And we can now, from the other lectures, differentiate between their geometries, H nu versus HF, for bosons and photons, electrostatics and electromagnetic fields. So we shouldn't be making mistakes like saying um, E equals H nu equals HF and things like that when we're describing these fields. They should be completely separated and understood that a zero point boson is complete, or a, a quantum boson, W boson, is completely different to a photon. And a photon is indeed comprised of opposite charge, or as correctly, Photons can be comprised of opposite charged bosons to create a neutral electromagnetic photon or alternatively they can be composed of similar charge bosons W 2W pluses, 2W minuses in which case the formulation is still correct 2H nu equals HF for the energy content but what we've created instead because they're both similar charges is instead of an electromagnetic photon we have an electrostatic photon the electrostatic photons electromagnetic photons chem fields quanta all have magnetic dipoles you can't get rid of magnetic fields by splitting them up they are comprised of zero point fields of electromagnetic energy with the magnetic being a dipole so to, to finalize this lecture I'll just briefly touch on adding energy when you apply a force to a particle 
you are exerting a force in a particular direction which results in the particle moving in a particular direction all you are doing and I'll recap on this in the next lecture all you are doing by applying the force to the the object F equals MA is changing its linear momentum by varying the amount of energy the particle has to move all that energy of motion is stored in the chem field the particle itself has not changed in any way shape or form it is exactly the same particle moving it and beyond the speed of light as it was standing still what has changed is the mass energy content of that chem field the kinetic EM field as more and more force is applied more and more energy is stored in that field the electric the kinetic energy component the electric and the magnetic dipole the magnetic moment component of that field gets stronger and stronger as more energy is included and that follows E equals H nu squared which is equivalent to H sorry because of omega geometries we know that H nu squared is equivalent to MV squared and the linear momentum we know which is the square root of MV squared square root of the equilateral triangle is its height is equivalent to MV the linear momentum so as we apply a greater force to a particle in any direction a secondary chem field as I call it it's an EM field it's not your typical EM field it's not a, a photonic EM field it's a charge it's an equilateral field but it's still electromagnetic and that's why I term it a chem field because it's an electromagnetic field that results from kinetic motion that chem field will be there as long as that particle is in motion no matter how slow or how fast that chem field has the square root linear momentum of the particle it has the magnetic dipole of the particle and they are proportional to the velocity of the particle mv squared equals h nu squared we know all that so now we know from inference from that that the the tenet of special relativity where the dipole appears because of a distortion in the particles physical geometry is incorrect all the energies of motion are stored in a chem field the particle itself does not change these fields irrespective of whether they're electrostatics bosons zero point fields Planck quanta electrostatic or electromagnetic or chem fields all have the same or self similar geometries as we've discussed in this lecture they're all born from Planck quanta from one Planck quanta with a charge either side to two or more we create energies and as energy is added it's always added in a square number in this case the illustration shows us positive Planck quanta at the top for electrostatic fields where we increase the number of charged Planck quanta in the field the fourth one has four Planck quanta three of which are positive one is negative hence there's a negative convergent component to the stronger divergent positive component which only increases as we increase more energy 9 16 they're all squared numbers but in the case of uh, these are chem fields we're talking about just the equilaterals pointing in the direction of motion but in the case of electrostatic and electromagnetic fields we could easily combine two opposite or similar charged fields together as you also see illustrated in this diagram for a field strength in which case we're doing electromagnetics in this illustration just to bring in the negatives you could bring a positive W boson and a negative W boson together to form a photon of frequency HF 2 H nu or 2 charged H nu equals HF and that relationship continues as we add more energy it's always at, at the square of the number you could say this is 2 4 squared 2 lots of of 4 quanta to form the top one and sorry 1 lot of 4 quanta to, 
to fill the first one, the, the positive, one lot of four quanta to fill the, the negative field, or you could say it's four photons. If you look at the field closely, there's a plus and minus pair, plus and minus pair, plus and minus, plus and minus, four photons. But two, eight, sorry, eight bosons, four photons. The relationship's the same, but if you split the, the electromagnetic field in half, you have two bosonic fields. The field strength is always the square. It maintains this relationship because of the geometry. Nature knows no other way to build or to fill an equilateral scalar field of electromagnetic energy than by the addition of odd numbers, bosons, to make squared equilateral geometries. And those geometries, just to, to finalize it, all have are all identical, they're all equilaterals, no other shape. The electric fields are an inverse squared, that is the, from the, the source point, as you move away from the source point, the number of uh, energy momenta available to accelerate a particle grows weaker and weaker, as according to the inverse square law. Start at three, for example, where I'm highlighting on four, you have three closest to it. You move away a distance, you only have one. Doesn't matter how many you've got, if you've got one down here with 13, closest to it you move as you move away you go 13 11 9 7 5 3 1 and you just keep weakening off as you move further and further away from the particle or conversely getting stronger as you move towards a particle inverse squared law magnetic dipoles follow a slightly different rule they're an inverse cubed law Again, something we'll touch on in the next discussion, where we, we do, I think it's pronounced biosavart, or I'll have to find the pronunciation. Their law shows that magnetic dipoles are an inverse cubed relationship from the point source. Why? Because if you look closely at the geometry, the magnetic dipole, as you move away, has a different relationship than moving moving left to right is a different geometric relationship than moving north to south basically I will touch on it in the next lecture so we have a different inverse relationship for magnetic dipoles than we have for electric fields but interestingly enough a magnetic pole moving away from a magnetic pole because it's one of the apexes from a magnet is an inverse squared law again Complicated, often overlooked, rarely ever explained. I think there's only one or two documents on the internet that go into it in any detail. It's known to electrical engineers, but for most intents and purposes, people don't worry about it because most interactions you would bring a north pole or a south pole in to interact with the pole, not the dipole. You'd be bringing a pole in to act with a pole, which is an inverse squared law. A dipole to a dipole is actually an inverse cubed law. Anyway, that's enough for this lecture. We've covered a lot in this one, just in differentiating what the simplest shapes that Planck coins can make are. We've covered the electric fields, the elect magnetic fields of electrostatic and electromagnetic fields, and we've gone through, derived and explained Coulomb and Ampere's law, reinforced the unification that Maxwell gave to both for his, his um, Maxwell laws, and his formulations, mathematical formulations for the same. But in this case, we've done it all geometrically. And literally, if you were unaware of the math, you could still build all these shapes and derive all these principles just from the geometry. You don't need to know the math. The math, as I put it, it's often referred to as a language. Um, as I put it, it is just that, it's a language. You don't necessarily have to speak German in order to travel through Germany. You can, of course, speak English. Or you can use a picture book to explain what you need. That's all tetrionics is, is a geometric reinterpretation of the math. And in doing so, in geometrically reinterpreting it, what we're now doing is having simple models 
that can replace things like right hand rules and complex calculations for permittivity, permeability, etc. And allow anyone of any age to just look at this and start using it. And that's what I hope everyone will be doing eventually. If you've got any questions, as always, feel free to message me and, and I'll get back to you with as many answers and as much detail as, as you can stand. Thanks again for your time.